to tell us what we should do, which in my experience immediately leads to people thinking of reasons why they should not do that. So I want to especially thank the five of them for actually confronting uh, those issues and um, giving us an insight into um, these brilliant visions of what the future could be. And I also want to thank Brian and Kaylee uh, for your passion around education and working with the Red Journal to address issues in our field and provide education for our membership. Um, it's always fun working with the two of you and um, you always do a great job uh, supporting, supporting the Red Journal. So um, without further ado, we are going to start with some brief uh, opening statements from our panelists. Uh, and we're going to go in reverse order of the polling results. So the first speaker will be Dr. Peter Maxim, and Peter's going to talk to us about Flash. Well, great. Thank you. So my name is Peter Maxim. I'm the director of medical physics at Indiana University, and uh, I will be talking about Flash today and reverse that polling information that Brian was just uh, showing us. But before I start, um, I really would like to thank Brian and Sue for inviting me today and congratulate Sue for becoming the next Editor-in-Chief for the Red Journal. I think this is a great uh, choice. So congratulations, Sue. All right. Um, so let me just give you a little um, introduction about Flash and why I think Flash plays will play a major role. Uh, not just in the 2020s, but even beyond. So uh, I think most of you have heard about this phenomenon flash, but what it stands for is ultra rapid radiation treatment with dose rates in excess of 40 gray per second. And so what that means is about 400 times faster that we're doing the fastest treatment that we're currently doing in our clinics. And um, you guys are all aware of the uh, of this pivotal paper that um, uh, the Fobadon group from the Korean Institute has published in uh, 2014, where they have shown that uh, uh, FLASH could play a major role by uh, increasing the therapeutic index of radiotherapy. And what they've shown in their pivotal paper there that uh, ultra-fast radiation delivery actually reduces uh, radiation fibrosis after, in, in, in line of mice after they radiate with the uh, whole thorax radiation. And the interesting finding of that was that they almost had to double the dose to um, show that uh, to, to achieve the same fibrosis as conventional dose rate radiation. So that was a groundbreaking paper um, that has um, uh, kind of reignited this, this uh, whole field of flash radiotherapy. So investigators at the uh, Lausanne University have also shown um, that flash maintains uh, neurogenesis in, uh, in, um, in mice, in the hippocampal region in, in, in mice after whole brain irradiation, which really translated in maintenance of or retention of cognitive function status uh, if they radiated with a threshold dose of 100 gray per second. Um, other studies have shown that, um, uh, uh, and this is a study that by Charlie Limoli's group at UC Irvine, that have shown that the flash preserves the neural, neuronal uh, microanatomy. You can see, the, see the, the changes in the dendritic spines uh, with conventional radiation and flash radiation. And then studies have also shown that uh, flash radiation is actually causing less normal tissue skin toxicity um, this is uh, the, the, the study done in, in uh, uh, skin uh, of pigs, and you can see that the commercial radiation causes necrotic spots after a, a whole uh, a single fraction of high dose of radiation, but flash completely um, um, uh, spares the tissue. And uh, this, is, this is another study done by the Lausanne group, and this is for you, Sue, you wanted to see the cat and the mouse and, and the nose. This is a, a study that uh, the Lausanne group has done irradiating the squamous cell carcinomas of, the, um, of cats in the, in the nose uh, using a single high dose of fraction of 25 to 40 gray uh, with great tumor control and um, um, minimal toxicity on the nose, as you can see in this lower panel. Just to give credit or, where credit is due, I believe uh, it was Wendy who was most interested in the cat picture. All oh, right, okay, so yeah. Wendy's so this is, our, this is our own study showing the, um, the effect, the flash effect of the whole abdominal radiation. Again, uh, 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 looking at, looking at uh, survival after a 16 gray of lethal dose, uh, animals that were irradiated with uh, flash radiation survived, whereas animals radiated with conventional dose rate died. And if you look at the microanatomy, flash maintained the uh, microanatomy here, um, shown the surviving crypt cells after flash and conventional dose rate radiation. 
Interestingly, the study that was done with electrons was replicated and confirmed by the PEN group that used a proton uh, facility to irradiate the uh, total abdominal of, of mice, and they replicated this study and have shown that uh, flash really maintains the, uh, the uh, microanatomy in, in the gut. And uh, in terms of tumor control, um, the question was, well, the flash irradiation really saves the normal tissue, but what about tumor control? And there's uh, several studies you know, ovarian cancers and subcutaneous uh, uh, tumors and orthotopic uh, lung tumors in animals, they have all shown that flash irradiation is iso-effective. So flash really, all these studies have actually proven solid data, as, as shown here, that they have proven that the uh, flash irradiation um, is a path towards increasing the therapeutic index by uh, uh, sparing the normal tissue, yet achieving iso-effective tumor control. Um, based on the studies that have been conducted in preclinical in a preclinical setting, the group at Lausanne University actually treated their first patient using high energy electron. This was a patient with uh, a T cell lymphoma that received many courses of radiation treatment, but they radiated this, this one lesion and they achieved great tumor control with minimal uh, skin toxicity. Uh, Varian has also repeated the, um, uh, a study that they've treated with their proton therapy center and their collaborators at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Their first human clinical trial using um, uh, uh, FLASH. They treated as uh, uh, bone metastasis with a single fraction of eight gray. But both of these studies, and there are many more being planned in the future, but both of these studies have actually shown that FLASH is translatable to human therapy. Um, all investigators have used sort of the same settings that they have um, uh, achieved in the preclinical settings, so they've been translated to human therapy, yet um, uh, there are some deficits on that. Um, it is, with this, the current technology, it's really not quite possible to treat larger tumors or deep situated tumors yet, so we need a new technology to, um, uh, to, to make this a to more general case. So asking and how to predict the future and what is the future? Well, um, there's a good question of how is the future looking like? And predicting is always tricky, but there's one way to, to predict the future is to invent it. And this is what we have been doing with collaborators at Stanford and uh, University and Slack uh, with my uh, close friend and colleague, Bill Liu. This is the phaser concept. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the phaser concept that um, uh, uh, we're, we're developing. This is a X-ray machine that is uh, producing highly conformal radiotherapy that will deliver um, the dose in flash dose so near and instantaneously fast enough to freeze motion. Uh, it might take advantage of the flash biology, but it's been also done in a very compact manner that it can be packed and deployed anywhere in the world where access to radiotherapy is, is sparse. So the future of radiotherapy, this might be a path towards it. Flash will play a major role. Um, it will be in a form factor that can be deployed anywhere in the world to address the real shortcoming and the uh, access to, to, to global and, and uh, to curative cancer therapy. So that is the future that I'm seeing. And before I pass the, the baton on to my next speaker, I really would like to reveal the, 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 the identity of the true uh, person that is behind the flash and the genius um, uh, behind the, the phaser concept. And you might all know him. Um, this is Bill Lou, um, my good friend and collaborator for the last 20 years. So Bill, if you're listening to this, um, it is my greatest honor and privilege to reinvent the future of your therapy with you. Thank you. That's awesome, Peter. I mean, um, I think we'll save questions for later, but you know, the obvious issue that comes up is I find it really intriguing that you're proposing a, a global adoption of this economical technology and whether that could really happen when you have um, manufacturers and the kind of safety precautions we'll need in places um, is something we can talk about. Anyway, uh, well, Wendy has something a lot more established to talk about. I do indeed. And give me one second to make sure I'm on my slides so that I can move them forward, which doesn't appear to be happening right this second. Maybe the trick is to make this smaller. Sorry, that's my email. I'm going to stop sharing for one second. 
back to this. And try again. That seems encouraging. I can't advance it while I'm sharing it. Does one of you want to pull it up and I'll, while I chat and see if you can take over? Um, so I'm Wendy Woodward. I am a breast radiation oncologist and I decided to do the MD-PhD program because I was really interested in science and I ended up in radiation oncology because in some ways it is the perfect marriage of science and medicine. It really allows you to still take care of patients and to know and comprehensively treat patients and be a part of um, diagnostics and imaging and all the things that are so important um, when you decide you want to go into medicine. But in some ways, it perfectly lends itself to the marriage of basic science and molecular biology and translational science. And I think the reason that the answer to the question, what should we be focused on in the next, in the 2020s, the next 10 years of molecular biology, is that that's how we're going to answer the question, who should get radiation and what radiation should they get? And it's a question that impacts literally every cancer patient. So many patients that we treat are going to get radiation. And in many uh, specialties in radiation, we're still giving radiation based on stage. And what we've seen happen in medical oncology is just a revolution to be able to take genomic predictors and understand, and here's where we predict the future for the patient, the natural history of their cancer. And if you can predict the natural history of their cancer, you can understand what role this radiation has. And then if you can predict the efficacy of radiation, you can decide, is the standard dose the right dose? Would less dose be better? Would more dose be better? And you can begin to say, how do we now marry that with what I fully know will be a fantastic um, presentation from Dr. Winkfield with equity and access. How do you actually be able to give patients exactly what they need in the most efficient way possible where they are? Um, and I think that is the, the beauty of what molecular oncology can bring us and what we should be doing as we look forward is to recognize that we don't have the right samples to be able to do the kind of predictive studies that have been done in medical oncology, but we are absolutely seeing this revolution for understanding who needs radiation. The second thing that molecular biology can give us is to understand what can we do better for the patients who, if they had access to the very best we have to offer, would not be cured. Because there's that group of patients too. There's a group of patients who aren't cured who could be, and that's a disaster. Molecular biology isn't gonna fix that. But what molecular biology can do is say, if you had access to it all, if we fixed the access problem and everyone had what they, we think is the optimal therapy, how do we then figure out why that therapy didn't work for them and where does radiation fit into that? Because it does. And if we don't actively answer those questions as a radiation oncology community, we will ultimately just be eliminated as a, the question here is radiation versus not. And the question is not radiation versus not. The question is what radiation and to what targets and why does it work? And so that to me is the answer. Why is molecular biology the thing that's going to impact the most patients? Because we know radiation works. We're all in radiation oncology because we know that radiation works. And we need to be a part of this progress moving forward to answer the question, who does it work for and how and how much? So that's why I would have voted for molecular biology as the, as the first answer, and I look forward to hearing how that intersects with all of the other answers. I'm sorry, my slides didn't work. That's you know, what they said. Um, Wendy, yeah, you I know, can I... walk through those slides for you. I'm showing oh. them on the live stream uh, if you wanted to. Oh, sure. Um... Yes. Yeah. So the first one, and I can't see them, but the first one, actually maybe now they show, but um, is basically that every patient should have access to a meaningful prognostic and predictive biomarker for the role and dose of radiation. And the limitation to having that is really the sample and the money to do it and analyze it for radiation oncology specifically. Because we can latch on to what medical oncology is doing and it will give us some information and there are great examples of that in breast cancer, prostate cancer, but even better is a radiation oncology specific prognostic or predictive biomarker. And that is attainable. It impacts a huge number of patients. The figure, and this is one of many, but this one comes from Zhang et al. from Nature Communications, 
is just a proof of principle example. Here's a centromere enrichment score. And you can see, looking at these patients at the top, overall survival, that this score actually dictates whether or not radiation is going to help you. So at the top, you see overall survival and disease-free survival if you have a high score. And radiation is great. You should have it. If you have an intermediate score, it helps some, but it's not going to knock it out of the park. And for patients who have a low score, there's no value to radiation. That's what patients want. When you have conversations with patients, they want to know, am I really going to benefit from this? And not just have it be an insurance policy. You might have cells left behind and it might help you. The second slide is this impact for the patients who are going to recur, even if they had the best available. And that also is attainable with the right effort and the right dollars. And again, it has to be really studied with radiation. And this is going to help us to move forward with immunotherapy and all of the novel agents that are coming along. You look in lung cancer at understanding these driver mutations, the ALK mutations, all of the different agents that are coming along. We have to understand those with radiation. Do we still need radiation for those patients? Yes. And, and what radiation and to what dose? And we really need a machine to answer those questions mechanistically so we can design reasonable trials. And that impacts overall survival because these are the patients who are not cured by the treatment they have. And just one example, this is the Pacific trial. That's the figure that's just highlighting that here in this group of patients that all got radiation, the really dramatic difference that immunotherapy can make. And we have to understand the role that radiation plays in that. So that's why I think the, the future has got to be about molecular biology. So we give the right treatment to the right patients. Um, and for patients that treatment is failing, that we get the right treatment. So I find so it really for the slide. Sorry for my technical problem. No problem. It was wonderful. The, um, the, I find it really fascinating. And I am really now just, just crazy to hear what Karen's going to say, because I find it absolutely fascinating. This is no knock on either of you, that both Peter and you, Wendy, um, are talking about questions of universal access and equity in um, connection with extremely expensive technologies that have traditionally um, not been that. So one of the questions actually is, you know, to your vision, Wendy, you know, how do we make something like, and we can talk about this later, how do we make something like, you know, these very expensive um, preclinical studies and trials, you know, really that have become very dependent on pharma, let's be honest. How do we take that and make that efficient and um, in a way that we actually do achieve that 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 goal more efficiently and more quickly um, for a larger number of people without you know essentially we're getting, seeing getting some progress to pharma pharma trials that are exclusionary. Yeah, I think that we're seeing some progress in direct to patient trials and direct to patient IRB studies. Right now, you have these. Um, groups like um, Count Me In, where you can enroll in a trial and send your um, biopsy specimen to the Dana-Farber, where they it developed this open access data. And you can imagine, if you're not prescribing the drug, you're really just saying what radiation, that you could have real-world trials that patients could enroll themselves in. And I get, I'm not trying to minimize the incredibly dramatic IRB issues that are involved in that. Um, but there are, there are software companies that do this and have beautiful patients like me is an amazing software platform that patients are putting their data into anyway that you can do research through and you can do trials through. So you could begin to ask the question in a safe way, does your doctor want to partner with me to give you what has been a thoughtful de-escalation of dose if you're getting this drug? Are there ways that we can more creatively study these things power them, have some control over them, and pull in patients who don't normally um, get incurred. And I think one of the questions you're going to ask later is, what would you do with a billion dollars? Well, that's what I do with a billion dollars, right, is figure out how to get all of these patients onto trials and how to make trials that work better for patients and represent patients and are prag prag pragmatic, real-world trials. Very classic view. Very classic view. Founding of the RTOG. Okay, Karen. Okay. Hey, I'm actually trying to turn my um, my volume off. Hi. Um, so good evening, everyone. Sue, boy, you teed me up really well. <laughs> I was actually going to thank Wendy and, and Peter for talking about and having such an inclusive approach, right? Um, Wendy said specifically, every patient should have access, right? But we know that not everyone does. 
And so while, you know, the topic that I've been tasked with talking about is diversity, equity, inclusion, I'm actually going to frame my comments around equity. Um, diversity and, and more importantly, inclusion, those are tools um, that can be used uh, as a means to an end, if you will, to uh, really work towards the goal of equity. And as radiation oncologists, I mean, we're all physicians and physicians, at least up through my kind of, after I finished medical school, we're all required to say this little ditty. It was called the Hippocratic Oath. <laughs> and there were a few uh, basic ethical principles that we all agreed to, right? Um, beneficence, non-malfeasance, justice, and respect for the patient. You know, we think about this concept oftentimes when we're doing our city training, we have to like re-up for our, our clinical trials. And we talk about, you know, wanting to have research ethics that researchers uh, should have the welfare of, of research participants as a goal of any clinical trial or research study that applies to medical care as well. And non-malfeasance really represents that, that doctor's attempt to avoid any act or treatment plan that could harm the patient or violate that patient's trust. And it has been popularized as first, do no harm, right? We, we say that oftentimes, you know, our goal is not to do any harm. So when we say those words, we only mean do no harm to certain populations. When we say those words as radiation oncologists, is justice only meant for a few? That when we say we're gonna respect our patients and individuals, that really it's only for those who are part of a majority? You see, cancer disparities represents harm to our patients. And the challenge for me personally <laughs> is that most of the harm is coming to people who look like me. Blacks are dying of cancer at almost twice the rate of any other group. They have the highest death rate, shorter survival of all racial and ethnic groups from cancer. Black men have the highest cancer incidence. In fact, you know, cancer deaths in black men are twice that of almost any other group. We know the numbers for prostate cancer that include higher incidence, but what about breast cancer in women where they have the same, black women have the same incidence as white women for development of breast cancer, but die of it at a rate of about 40% higher. And some of that's related to the fact that they're not oftentimes offered radiation. We know that they're not getting all the standard of care. And so part of the challenge is for us as radiation oncologists is are we clinicians or technicians? What is it that we want our field to be known for? Is it just a technology piece? Is it just the fancy new gadgets? Or are we really clinicians? Are we really physicians who believe in the Hippocratic Oath and believe that everyone should have access? You know, it's fascinating, you know, when we look and we dial down into some of the community engagement activities that you all know I'm very <laughs> fond of, it's important to dial down, to talk to the community, find out what some of the issues are. Did you know that about a third of African-American women, a third of black women report experiencing racial discrimination during a health provider visit? So it's not just about being able to have transportation or you know limitations in terms of insurance. It's active discrimination, active harm that's being done. And it may not even be us as clinicians, but we are ultimately responsible for the environment in which our patients find themselves. People want to look at, oh, well, this is a segregated community, and these people, you know, these people, right? You've heard that before. You know, they're non-compliant. There's some other issues. It's not always the case. And the sad part is, is that there are even oncologists amongst us today who still don't believe that disparities exist. They don't believe that racism exists, despite the physical and harm that we saw inflicted upon George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. These harms were derived out of a system that is racist. And it's still prevalent in this country. And we saw that in full swing this November when more than 70,000 people, including some radiation oncologists, some of our colleagues, voted for someone who began their political career with racial slurs, who egged on white supremacy groups and said that, oh, there are good people on both sides of a community conflict that included neo-Nazis and other hate groups. Racism is alive and well, and it impacts and influences and affects our ability to give good care to everyone. 
Well, some might say, well, I'm not racist, you know, or, or I treat all of my patients the same. Well, first of all, that last statement, please don't say that <laughs> because that's actually steeped in racist tradition. You know, you cannot treat everyone the same because they're not the same. They're different individuals and they have different needs. And so that's where equity comes in understanding what those needs are and taking time to find out from each and every patient who walks through the door what their needs are. Not just making an assumption based on what their disease is, but really having personalized medicine. Wendy just talked about the importance, right, of thinking about molecular biology to personalize medicine. But we need to do that as well in how we react and respond to the people sitting in front of us. Blacks need more. You know, in some of my talks, I, I actually show this image and it has a timeline on the bottom that shows the history of Blacks in the United States. Over 400 years of oppression, most of that as an enslaved population. Set free, 1860s, but not really, right? Segregation, policies that have impacted their ability to build wealth, that have separated families and communities, that have created that segregated educational systems, banks, insurance, housing, everything stacked against them and the system is there and this is not that long ago i mean this is in the 1970s when segregation was not was no longer legal but we know it's still happening we know redlining is still a thing right and still people say blacks just need to get over it well what does all this have to do with radiation oncology right well i'm letting you know that the system is rigged folks and remember that little oath we took to first do no harm. If the system we work in, if the structure of the institutions we work for are harming our patients, then it's our collective responsibility to work towards improving the system. Now remember there are sins of commission <laughs> and there are sins of omission, right? A surgeon nicks a femoral artery during a procedure or inadvertently leaves an, in leaves an instrument within the patient, right? Commission, active, omission, forgetting about. Radiation dose delivered to the wrong body part, right? Or, you know, a region, nodal regions are excluded in a woman who has breast cancer that had nodal involvement at the time of her diagnosis, you know, commission, omission. And most would not make those errors, you know, willingly, right? Of course, we know that there are a few examples of physicians who have indeed become serial killers. That's hopefully none of us as radiation oncologists. But if we keep seeing patients die and we don't act, then we do bear some of the blame. And there's no better time than now to work on equity. It's at the forefront. Everyone's talking about it, right? We see how challenging the inequities have made even dealing with COVID. This pandemic is worse in black and brown communities. It disproportionately impacts the same communities that are disenfranchised and have the same poor outcomes from cancer. We see it. What good are therapeutics? What good is molecular biology? What's good is flash? AI, what difference does it make if some people do not have access to that care? And you know, inequities are expensive. <laughs> I hate to bring up the finances, but a trillion dollars a year, that's what health disparities cost. Now, some people only can think about dollar signs, right? I should be able to just say this is a social justice issue because again, that little ditty we said, that Hippocratic Oath talked about justice and the importance of that. But we need to do something about all of this. Is it a big issue? Yes. Will it be a challenge? Yes. <laughs> but we are radiation oncologists and we pride ourselves on our innovation. We pride ourselves on finding new solutions to problems. So my hope is that we actually use our skills creatively to think about how we as a body of physicians, a body of practitioners, radiation oncologists can lead the way in ensuring equitable access to every community. Thank you. Thanks so much, Karen. That was uh, really powerful. And um, just want to thank you for sharing some of the personal parts of that. And um, I, you know, so I'm going to give you a hard time, just like I gave everybody else a hard time, which this, Bring question, it. Is kind of, this question is kind of more for you. And I'm interested to hear what Dan has to say about this, which is that, um, you know, this just comes out of my personal experience at my institution. A lot of the people who are working on DEI are not from radiation oncology. And Dan, this is for you too. A lot of the people working in education actually who are making some of the bigger strides are from medicine or radiology. So, you know, the question here is, you know, is this something that radiation oncology specially contributes to? 
or is this just part of our ongoing obligation as part of the community medicine? But I'm, I'm interested here talking, and I don't want to take more of your time. Yeah, just yeah, that no, that's a very, uh, very interesting question. Later. Yeah, no, like, so which part of this do we, is this part of a collective? And, and the answer is yes and yes, right? So I do think that there are things that we need to work on as institutions and as just uh, the healthcare system in general. I, I firmly believe we need to just overhaul the entire healthcare system, but that's, that's a whole other thing. But I think as radiation oncologists, we can do things individually. I mean, how many of us have seen a patient who may have not had the appropriate surgery, right? Say a breast cancer patient. Maybe they didn't have nodes sampled or whatever. Or maybe they didn't get their full course of chemotherapy, but then were sent to radiation because the patient was non-compliant, right? Or maybe we've seen a gentleman with prostate cancer who had locally advanced prostate cancer at the time of diagnosis and still had a robotic procedure and had cut through, right? Because they knew they were going to cut through it. They were going to cut through the prostate and then had to get a second therapy. These are little examples of ways that we might be able to impact and influence what's happening locally. We are clinicians and we know what the standard of care is for our patients, but we also know that not everyone has access to that. Not everyone has access to clinical trials. And so we can do things ind individually, you know, as practitioners at our own institutions, but we can also stand up as a body of radiation oncologists and say, we value equity. We want to make sure that our fabulous technologies get into the to everyone. We know we have trouble with rural patients, right? So we're not even adding geography into this. We are simply talking about race, ethnicity, which you look in the urban settings and you have people that don't have access to radiation. I mean, what gives? So yes, I do think that there's something that we collectively as clinicians and providers and healthcare workers need to think about, but there are things that we can do as radiation oncologists that can help to achieve equity, not only for our individual patients, which is what we really should be focused on, but also the patients that we see in our department, the patients that we see at our cancer centers. Okay, Dan, she's making half your argument for you. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> Karen is bringing it. <laughs> thank, thank you. While, while I'm pulling up my slide, I'll, I'll answer briefly that um, I think absolutely, even though radiation oncology is small and, and maybe traditionally has been more peripheral in medical schools. It's absolutely a place for education and educational innovations. I think in some ways being small is a strength. Um, you know, we're, we're more nimble. We can do things. I'll, I'll give some examples actually in my uh, kind of intro. Um, so uh, I want to just take a minute to thank the Virtual Visiting Professor Network and the Red Journal for inviting me to participate. Um, it's really exciting to see education included on the same stage as uh, something as cool as uh, artificial intelligence, you know, molecular biology, DEI, flash RT. Um, I also want to specifically thank the Red Journal for their support over the last uh, several years, 10 years or more for, of uh, educational scholarship. So um, I, I was asked to discuss three things, um, at least in this introduction. First, how did I come to work in educational scholarship? Uh, why am I passionate about education? And what is the fundamental argument as to why education is critical to the future of our specialty? So. Um, I'm actually originally from Oakland, California, so probably short drive from where Sue is now. And I came to Chicago for medical school and stayed here for the, the great weather and the great skiing. Um, that's a joke. Zoom's hard because you can't hear people laugh through Zoom. But anyway, uh, I actually stayed. The, the biggest reason I stayed was I ended up meeting my uh, eventual wife and um, she had a job here and we wanted to stay in the city. But uh, the second reason in many ways was education. Uh, when I was a PGY4 in residency, I kind of on a whim applied to a uh, one year mini medical education fellowship at the University of Chicago where I, I did my residency. Um, I'd always enjoyed teaching, but I, I never really knew how I could actualize that as an actual career path. Um, and I kind of figured, what do I have to lose? So I applied and, and got into this one year program. It was really a, a transformative experience. I met some amazing leaders in medical education outside of my department. So Sue, to your point, these were um, internists, pediatricians, ob gyn anesthesia, surgeons. Um, other specialties, and I, I kind of realized there was this tremendous opportunity for scholarship of education in radiation oncology that was completely untapped, and also in oncology in general. Um, and so when I decided to take my current job, I, I took it in part knowing that I'd continue to be able to work with these mentors. Um, and I, I've been on the faculty for eight years now and um, continue to look to these colleagues outside of my department for inspiration and guidance. Um, and they ended up encouraging me to pursue a master's in health professions ed education, which also was really transformative. Um, so why, why is education critical or a critical area for radiation oncology in this decade? Um, and really, I would say in the next century. Uh, first, I, I think everyone participating in this debate has education in common. 
Uh, we all went through educational systems to get where we are. And I think all of us remain actively involved as educators in some capacity. It may be mentoring students, teaching residents, sitting on PhD committees, but we all went through an educational process and now educate others in some way, shape or form. Um, also, for those of us that are clinicians, we educate our patients every day. To, so to, I think to Karen's, uh, Karen's point, you know, a good clinician is able to figure out how to teach their patient um, so that uh, you know, it's not forcing them to be compliant, but they understand why they need to um, follow up or have a mammogram or come in for their, their routine PSA checks. Um, it, some of you may not know, uh, but the word doctor ac actually comes from the Latin word docere, which means to teach. Um, if you've been wondering why I put this painting up um, on my slide, uh, it's not really to so it's not to show the surgeons and the patients in the foreground, but the students and observers in the background. And this painting to me is as much about medical education as it is about surgery or the new aseptic techniques that were being used in the late 1800s. So with this in mind, I, I asked my colleagues and also all those of you watching right now, um, how many of you stepped back and really reflected on what the best way would be to train and educate someone to get them to where you are now? Um, what is the best way to train someone to be a world-class molecular biologist, a physicist that works on cutting edge treatment technology or AI or a leader in promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion? Um, and I, I'm not here to say that my esteemed colleagues' areas of expertise are not important, just that without education, none of them would be here in the first place. Um, for too long, education has been viewed as something everyone can do as a sidebar to their real profession, and I, I think that needs to change. Uh, I'm sure everyone will agree with me that modern evidence-based medicine is far superior to snake oils, leeches, bloodletting, and salves that we used to cure diseases hundreds of years ago. And I think in 100 years, we're going to look forward at, at this kind of haphazard apprenticeship educational system that we use in clerkships and in residencies, arcane and inefficient. Um, this isn't being recorded, right? Uh, now is the best time to start building on ev an evidence base of best education. I laughed, Dan. I laughed. <laughs> of best educational practices, developing developing more efficient and robust educational methods, and pooling our resources and efforts to prevent unnecessary duplication and redundancy. Uh, the Astro st Strategic Plan's core purpose is to advance the field of radiation oncology, and the first major area of focus is to elevate the profile of the field with the goal of establishing radiation oncology as an equal partner in the cancer field. I hate to break it to you, but we aren't going to convince the 60 year old thoracic surgeon that radiation oncology is an equal player. They're, they're kind of a, uh, you know, we got to give up on them. Um, in my opinion, uh, we need to win the hearts and minds of the medical students and the junior residents. We need to get on the ground floor at the same time as our colleagues in medicine, surgery, peds, ob anesthesia, derm, emergency medicine that all have required clerkships. Um, I, I'm guessing all of us work in departments of radiation oncology, but how many of our departments have dedicated time in the medical school curriculum. Um, we're never going to win this PR battle if we wait until students and residents have gone through the hidden curriculum and learned that we don't matter or are merely technicians. Um, I'll conclude this opening statement, although I realize we're almost two thirds of the way through, uh, by saying I think there's five areas of educational focus going forward. Uh, undergraduate medical education or medical school, graduate medical education, continuing medical education, interprofessional education, and patient education. Um, we have the beginnings of a medical education collaborative network here in the United States, and actually it's, it's a global network, uh, the Radiation Oncology Education Collaborative Study Group, or ROCSIG. Um, we hosted our first symposium in 2018 as a, a way to bring educators together and give them an opportunity to present their work and discuss ideas and exchange ideas and develop collaborations. So we had about 40 attendees in 2018. In 2019, we had 80. Um, in 2020, because of COVID, we had to go virtual, but we had 230, over 230 unique attendees from across the globe. Um, I, I would argue medical education is the foundation of all aspects of our specialty and, and medicine in general, and an investment in medical education over the next 10 years will only benefit everyone participating in this debate this evening. Uh, I'll conclude my opening slash middle of the debate statement there. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Um, okay, and now we go to our pre-debate poll winner, Chuck Mayo, uh, who's going to talk about AI. And, uh, and, and yes, Chuck, AI, AI was the winner. I don't know if we announced it was the, oh yeah, Brian did show your slides, right? Uh, was the, uh, was the favored uh, option by, by our um, poll respondents. Okay. Well, <laughs> with that, with that, yeah, big buildup, Chuck. With, you with can't that let us build down. Up, 
with that buildup, although I would say at this point, I would probably, I, I put education and, and DEI really central to everything that we care most about. Um, so thank you for having me. Is that, a, is that a technique, being nice? Is that <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, I look around and look at life and think what makes it feel worth living. And, you know, those things have to come before AI. Um, so I'm a physicist, a physicist, straight physicist by training. And coming out of grad school was looking for a way to actually, you know, connect the dots to make things meaningful and help people. And I was tremendously fortunate to stumble into the possibility of medical physics, which I knew nothing about after grad school. And I go to work every day thankful that I, you know, as a as a physicist, I can actually see and participate in trying to make people's lives a bit better through the work that we do. Um, turning back to AI, I, I think AI is really important. I think the reason it, it rises in people's consciousness is that it really links importantly to all the topics um, we're talking about today. Um, there's a steady drumbeat of progress in AI, in automation, big data sources, and they're going to fundamentally change not only how we function in radi radiation oncology, but how our society is going to become structured and how we're going to relate to one another and to our workplaces. So it's, it's beyond just radiation oncology. When I think about this um, particular point in history and AI emerging, it reminds me of a, of a quotation from Dickens, you know, from, from the time, you know, just during the industrial revolution, just after the Scottish enlightenment. Or he said it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief, it was the epic of incredulity, it was the season of light, it was the season of darkness, it was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. And as we watch AI coming forward, I think it's fascinating because it's very complex. It's not necessarily all good. Um, and it's really important that each of us step in, in our, in our own ways to shape how these innovations that AI will usher in to make it um, everything as wonderful as it can be. So let's think about some of the ways that it, it makes it really the best of times. So the, the technology is advancing rapidly to really democratize um, ability to use AI. So cloud-based um, approaches are coming to the fore, so it becomes possible if you don't have all of this infrastructure to start to use that. Um, the software languages um, that enable you to use machine learning um, are becoming spread more broadly, so it tends to democratize ability to participate in ways that just aren't precedented um, in what we've had before. they are fascinating tools arriving with deep neural nets and recursive neural nets, generative adversarial networks. So it's really exciting to see how this is evolving. So not only major academic centers can benefit, but also community clinics. Um, another area that's really terrific now is standards development. So AI needs lots of high quality data um, to really do well. So it's fascinating to look through the journal articles that come through. A lot of them come through from, not just from, not from the US, but actually from other countries where for other reasons of the way their healthcare systems have evolved, people have access to even more data. Um, and one of the things we struggle with right now is that there's, there's a lack of standardization in how the data is organized, how it's presented. It gets in the way of having the large data sets that can take, make the most advantage. But right now, um, AAPM and ASTRO are moving quickly in developing standardized ontology of patient treatment outcomes details. It's getting worked into HL7. It's laying the groundwork for interoperable data exchanges and automations. I think this is tremendously important. I mean, we need equity in data and we need to take on gathering data, not just from major academic centers and skip the hard work needed to get the data from community centers and underserved populations. You know, that just bakes in disparities. You need to handle both rural and urban centers, white and non-white communities, affluent and non-affluent. If we don't do that, we build in biases that are gonna undermine the quality of our conclusions and just fundamentally damage the public policy decisions that can be drawn from them. 
So all the work that's being done with standards development and trying to make this something that can be implemented uniformly is really vital to get bringing out the best of what AI can do rather than just baking in preconceived notions and things that have already been done. Decision support is coming along really fast. We've seen it in radiology um, maturing faster and ahead of what's happening in radiation oncology, but it's coming there too. And there's some fascinating work being done outside of radiation oncology um, in, in trauma care and using, using AI to predict uh, patients who are not going to do so well to be able to anticipate that. And some of what, what's coming out of that stresses some of the great things that's happening in the education side because there's an emergence of people are getting used to these tools of recognizing you can't just present results in a way that an informaticist understands. You need something the way the physician thinks about it. Um, it needs to be done much more closely with uh, the way uh, we function normally in the clinic um, and those tools um, being developed. And so um, you're seeing tools evolving that are combining good statistical measures along with machine learning so that you can actually get something that physicians can process. And on the education th side, I think that emphasizes the importance of physicians participating actively in development of AI tools and ramping up their skills so that we don't just have good tools that can be developed by people who are not necessarily physicians, but work closely with them, but really great tools developed by physicians who've also ramped up their AI skills. Um, also, we're, you know, the, the decision support is here to stay in very interesting ways. There's an art, article just recently came out in um, Journal of Nuclear Medicine, where they're taking a look at potential jurors um, in liability trials and finding physicians who follow artificial intelligence advice may have less liability in the long run. So it's an interesting turn of events for how that can mature. Fascinating to see how all of this will evolve. Um, we know automated segmentation is really just around the corner, and that's going to start fundamentally changing the way that we work in the clinic. Um, and a lot of those systems are becoming democratized again. So there's Google DeepMind, uh, Microsoft's InterI project. All of these are starting to put these technologies in the hands of a wider community. We're seeing automated treatment planning um, coming into the fore, and that's going to be changing the way that we work. Um, genomics and biomarkers being combined. So now we're getting more infrastructure to be able to gather the genomics information, better AI tools for being able to combine them. So we can get that whole picture um, developed to, to understand how to take best care of the patient. But let's think of, you know, it starts to bring some of the worst times. So one of the scarier things right now is the commoditization of patient data. So we've all heard that data is the new oil. But if you hearken back to the changes in the early 20th century that reshaped our world around oil, in the age of data tools for extracting it and refining it and using it, are they gonna have, they're gonna have the same revolutionary impact on our economies that are revolve around them. And how are we gonna navigate that mix in healthcare um, with corporate interests in an ethical way? It's a place where we all need to be active and participating. I don't know if any of you saw the 60 Minutes pieces aired a couple of weeks ago on commercial uses of genomics data and efforts by um, foreign countries to gain access to US patient data, but it's very sobering. Um, another area that's very concerning in the AI is that it can emerge to reinforce um, disparities versus taking an opportunity to, revert, to reduce those disparities. So if you haven't had a chance to uh, listen to Dr. Uh, Timnit uh, Geberu, she was um, formerly the co-lead of ethical artificial intelligence team at Google. Um, she, she presents a very sobering view of how AI is emerging. Um, one of the things she discusses is from uh, looking at the composition of people participating. So as they're trying to bring in um, large groups of people interested in um, in developing AI and you look out at the audience and she reflects most of those people do not look like her. Um, and some of those racial disparities for the people who are participating, who are developing the tools are starting to get baked in, in terms of who's there. That also goes to education. So if we're not proactive in saying, you know, we need to get, a, we need diverse set of people participating 
on the education side so they can go on and develop, we'll never get to the place where you know, we overcome that problem that just keeps tripping us up. So it's really important to, to do that up front. Um, another part that is difficult is understanding what this is going to mean to succeed. So this is scary. Um, you know, the danger is not that AI is going to replace the need for us. The danger is to those who reject ad adapting to it and growing and learning so that they can use the AI and drive what happens, choosing not to participate because it's coming. But if we're very proactive um, on the, then we'll be able to shape how this functions in our society and what this is going to mean for us. So in summary, I think uh, AI and big data are going to play really big roles in the next few years, shaping um, our history and whether we decide this, ultimately, this is the best of times or the worst of times. Thank you. Nice, nice summary statement there, Chuck. And, um, you know, you left your physics brother, the phaser guy, you left him behind. <laughs> <laughs> went off with went off with the doctors. Um, so so my question for all of you is, um, which Brian told me was the best question. So we're going to go with the best question since um, we don't want to keep people too long. Uh, a lot of residents are actually kind of concerned about what is perceived as the contraction of the field, that things are getting uh, smaller, um, more difficult, research is expensive, hard to make a career. There's not even jobs. Um, any of you jump in here and tell me, how do we fix that? Where do we go to make this field bigger, not smaller? And, I'll get, jump people in. Jo and get people jobs. I'll, I'll jump in and point out that uh, two treatment uh, devices that have been used pretty ubiquitously, the gamma knife and the cyber knife were developed by neurosurgeons. Um, and I, I think that by educating all of me, all, all physicians about radiation as a therapeutic potential, uh, potentially therapeutic modality. Um, we may have colleagues that outside of our specialty even that have an idea and say, oh, you know, I did a two week rotation during my third year of medical school. And I, I never thought that maybe we could ablate, uh, you know, uh, uh, focus on the heart that's causing a, an arrhythmia. Um, and I, I know that there's people who will say, well, that's, you know, one tiny example of how we've found a new indication for radiation, but I, I think that by exposing all physicians to what we do and educating them about the, the reality of radiation, you know, it, it really spans from systemic therapy for TBI to essentially surgical-esque therapy for with SBRT or SRS. So you know, there's a lot of potential for radiation and, and the more people that know about it, the more chance we have to open up new avenues for uh, um, their new indications. And, and I would supplement uh, Dan's statement in here. Um, it, it, I talked to many residents and, and we've seen it, especially in radiology, sort of a dip in applications, particularly in last year, residents application. And so the question, why is that? And so one of the fears that has been sort of propagated in, in chat boards in the community is that, look, there are other uh, treatment modalities that will put radiation out of, out of the business. Systemic therapies are getting better. I would argue that with the all the knowledge, with all the advances, molecular biology, AI tools, we will be able to treat metastatic diseases. We will be able to treat diseases and sites that we're not able to do it right now, but we will be doing them in the future. I would think that the better systemic therapies are getting, the more the role for radiation therapy will be, uh, will be there. There's not a single drug out there that, kills a, that, that eradicates a solid tumor. With all that, I think the future is bright. The, the, we will get to that point that we will be able to treat any stage metastatic diseases, whether with have fractionated flash or anything, but the tools will be available to molecular biology, to AI. We haven't even talked about non-cancer indications. Arrhythmia, for example, that has made wind. I mean, if you look at just cardiovascular disease, if radiation even plays 1% for the population, that dwarfs anything what we've done in cancer. So, Dan is right. We need to educate our residents. We need to educate the surgeons. We need to educate from the beginning on that radiation will always have a role and that the role will be even more stronger in the future with all the advances 
around it. So um, I don't think there is a reason to be afraid of radiation that will not go away. It's actually going to get brighter and brighter. I agree with that. And I think it's about the value proposition. You know, at the end of the day, it's not how can we get, radi get rid of radiation and radiation oncologists need to be a part of that conversation. The question is, if radiation provides this local benefit, but it's small and radiation takes six weeks, well, that's not a value proposition. But if it provides a real benefit and it's easy and feasible and you have access to it and it gets paid for, then you do it and it expands. And so I think um, knowing what the value is and providing everybody access to it absolutely grows the field. And Wendy, you, you kind of said exactly what I was going to say about value, but it also means that there has to be payment reform. Um, I think that's part mm -hmm. of the challenge. You know, uh, look, I'm a lymphoma doc, right? And so a lot of my, my fractionation schemes are 12 or less, and that doesn't make money for radiation oncology departments, and, but it does, it's curative. And so, you know, the way that the current system is set up, it actually really kind of provides incentive in some ways to treat longer, whereas now we've seen in COVID, we can contract uh, treatment times, we can contract uh, the length of time that is required for a definitive radiation therapy, but that means that we have to have a different payment model to make sure that we still have the capacity to run our centers and run, you know, our practices in a good way. Um, and it's not, you know, popular, but I think we also have to be thoughtful about kind of what our personal reimbursements are, you know, and how much money we make. We I think that sometimes can be a fear in terms of wanting to keep the field small, um, but that again goes to and speaks to you know what the current payment models are like. I'm hearing from the two of you a sort of a common theme, which is it's always it's interesting to hear uh, two of you come to the same point, which is you know specificity and efficacy, and how do we kind of um, you know get there, um, getting getting the radiation to the people who need it in the right way. Um, to all of the people who need it. And so my other question for you before we uh, turn it over to Kaylee is, okay, so I think the, the cancer budget is about six billion a year. And let's say we had 1 billion and we could give it to one of you to just figure out how to um, prioritize that. What is the process for deciding that? How does radiation prioritize? Because all five of you, you know, presented pretty strong cases for what you do. And so, so where do we go with this? I think you start with- I think you start with impact. Sorry, go ahead, Chuck. Oh, okay. I, I was thinking you, you start with a guiding- have robot figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I think you start with a guiding principle and the, the, the one that has worked through much of this is that we should be able to learn from every patient treated. And and we sh that means by extension, being able to get treatment to every patient that needs it. And so including underserved communities, because otherwise we lose information. And looking at what are the things that undermine our ability to do it? What are the infrastructure problems? What are the health, you know, the health policy prop issues that prevent us from doing that? Meeting that policy so that, or that principle so that we can learn from everyone, I. I think that shapes it. I was going to say, if I hadn't been assigned molecular biology, and I, I don't take anything away from my passion for molecular biology, to me, it would come down to patient impact, how many actual patients would be impacted by those dollars. Um, and I had the honor to serve for ASTRO on the National Cancer Policy Forum, which is a whole table of luminaries in cancer, and then me. And I just thought it was so cool listening to them. And I had the chance to hear Otis Brawley, who was the CEO of um, the ACS, say, if every American had the same cancer outcome as a college-educated American, we would improve overall survival 25%. When has there been a randomized trial maybe Al Saraf, right? Like one head neck trial that has that level of overall survival difference. So that's where the impact comes to me. And I would say, start with diversity and inclusion and public health, start with public health because that is where the biggest impact is. And then ask, how do you facilitate that? With molecular biology, you do it by figuring out who needs what. 
With AI, you do it because that rural doctor can push a button and get high quality, big academic center radiation based on a thousand patients who were just like that somewhere. Um, and the education piece is getting everybody to where they understand how to use these tools to do the right thing. And that it's not a rubber stamp. I don't think AI is going to replace radiation oncologists. Um, and you're going to have to train radiation oncologists to do it. Um, and, and then, and there, of course, there's going to be a place for the big expensive um, radiation oncology toys. Um, and they're great, but they're not going to be, you know, carbon is not going to solve public health, but there are probably some sliver of things that can't be cured with the tools we have that might be cured with that. And that deserves peer reviewed R01 funding. Flash deserves peer reviewed R01 funding. But the billion dollars from taxpayers, to me, that's all impact public health. Yeah, so, so I, of course, have to second that. Thank you so much for stating my argument and stating it so nicely, but it also will pay for itself, right? Remember the AACR report that came out last year in September that kind of showed the disparities in cancer talked about the $1 trillion a year that it costs, that health disparities cost. So if we focus on figuring out how to create equity in the system, that we will actually pay for the other things that we'd like to do, including education, AI, et cetera. And we'd be able to, like, like uh, Chuck was saying, have the good data that goes in. And so from my perspective, I think systems that allow patients to access the care are critical. So yes, we do need a public health strategy, but something is simple, simple as creating patient navigators, like health navigators are really vital. I mean, I could establish some of that when I was at Wake Forest and, and as part of my role as the Associate Director of the Cancer Center, where I essentially pulled together a population health navigation program. Not only did it improve access to care, we got people the transportation that they required, and it also improved clinical trial enrollment by 50% for our underserved, most underserved populations, rural, Hispanic, and African-American. So again, we can achieve so much if we put our lens on public health, public policy, and really making sure that equity is up front. I have to jump in here though, Wendy, and build your build your argument up a little bit because it's interesting because um I, you know, before COVID, I actually used to travel and I got to go to Canada and um, it turned into this interesting sort of um, discussion about molecular equity which is that, um, uh, you know, right now, one of the really interesting things that a lot of people don't realize is cancer is one of the most inefficient areas of medicine that exists. You look at things like Alzheimer's, diabetes, um, you know, we treat these things very effectively, right? Extremely effectively, um, really good algorithms for what to do with those people. Uh, cancer patients actually have the highest risk of having an ineffective therapy. And so if you really think about equity from that, perspective, you know, and of course I was in Canada at the time, bringing everybody to the same point, right? Because right now we have people who do well, and we have people who don't do well, and how do you bring them all up to, to doing well? So I just um, want to kind of throw that spin in there. Um, Kaylee, I'm going to turn it over to you. I don't, I don't know if you have any uh, additions here that you want to throw in. Um, yeah, we have um, a couple questions, uh, mostly just a lot of people really um, emphasizing what's already been said, and, and I think everybody really appreciates the um, uh, the, the comments that have been made about public health and equity. And, um, so, um, we have one here from, uh, let's see, one question that's already kind of been touched on, um, was, uh, oh, sorry, it's jumping around. More people are commenting. Um, is there a way to increase our scope of practice, both quantity of cases and quality through EDI initiatives, leadership, and leading AI methods in our field and in other fields? So kind of been touched on, I just thought since that was one of the questions we had, I'd give people a chance to expand upon it. Can you repeat that, Kayla? I didn't quite understand. What was the beginning of that? Can we increase, say it again? Is there a way to increase our scope of practice mm -hmm. okay. through, through these different methods? I think that was with DEI and uh, AI and everything. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll certainly say that if um, the people who need to get the radiation actually got it, there'd be more people in the system, right? So, I mean, that's that's one thing, right? So, you know, creating the infrastructure to get our rural patients to a site where they can get treated, that'd be great. Uh, creating uh, opportunities for our African-Americans who, you know, a black woman with breast cancer, you know, 20% of those people who really would benefit from radiation oftentimes aren't even referred. Yeah. So, so we've got to do better with just kind of making sure that the people 
who should, based on our current standard of care, get radiation therapy are actually getting it, you know? And so that's... Uh, and, and, I, and I would add from the AI standpoint, you, you have to start from recognizing that our systems for being able to gather the information so we can learn from one patient to improve care for the next are just fundamentally broken. And we're never designed in the first place to be let you get that data back and learn from them. So you can't, you know, we need to do these things, but we need to do it not assuming the data will come as a byproduct, but being more proactive and saying, what do we need to do um, in our infrastructure, in our clinical practices, with the technologies we use to assure that that process for gathering it is automated and works in the community clinic and the rural clinic just as reliably as it can work in the academic center. And that doesn't just happen. So you got to, you really got to do that with intent. All that lost data, Chuck. It kills me every <laughs> time. Well, I could also like to draw that, that um, you know, we all know the role of radiotherapy and, and who benefits from that. But I, I would like to just really draw the statistics that a quarter of people that would benefit from radiotherapy and this is not just U.S., this is just as globally, simply do not have access to radiotherapy. I just learned recently there are four linear accelerators in Zimbabwe. There's maybe 10 in entire Africa. People who have access, who can benefit from radiotherapy, simply have no access. Our scope as a advanced society is we have to develop technologies that allow access to radiotherapy. And this technology has to be made simple to use. It has to be curative, it has to be made simple. That means we have to make the effort to hide all the complexities in this technology and make it available for everybody. Ideally, the future radiation machine should have two buttons, three buttons on off QA, and it should happen automatically. And it should be available with the highest curative potential to every patient, no matter where on, on, the, on this planet. And it would be oh, good if it school. didn't, yeah. And it would be good if it didn't hurt anybody. <laughs> um, yeah. Just putting That'd in a little, little, little vote for flash there. Um, Kaylee, any, anything else or? Uh, oh, people are just gonna make comments too about, um, you know, any thoughts on incorporating radio pharmaceutical therapies, um, you know, just kind of pointing out different ways that we could expand our, our scope of practice there, so. Um, if anybody has thoughts on that, that'd be great. Otherwise, I know Sue. I know you had um, some other questions that were that were pretty thoughtful too. So, so Kaylee, let me just say about the. You know, I, I was really eager to to build a radio immunotherapy program at the last two institutions I was at, but there's so much pushback um, from some of the other folks who actually have access to it currently. So, I think um, you know we know that radiology and nuke med um, oftentimes are the ones who are helping with administration. There's certainly some use utility um, in looking at um, you know alpha emitters. I think would be a really great way to start thinking about how we can treat and manage patients with metastatic disease. Um, so I, I do think there's a role for it. I think there might be a little bit of a turf war, um, and that's something that potentially we might be able to come to together um, with our colleagues, kind of some, same way that, you know, as, as Dan had mentioned, you know, neurosurgeons were the ones who developed the gamma knife, <laughs> and, but we work with them, right, to kind of figure out a way that, that everyone can benefit. Great, thank and you. I can say with my astroscience council hat on, but I know that is something that Astro is really interested in really helping to define those symmetry and and really put rad on arms around some of that thanks well i'm gonna um sort of wind things down because we don't want this to be uh too long for people uh, you know especially on the east coast and thanks to everyone i um i i really enjoyed this, this is a spirited conversation um really want to thank our five brave panelists who put themselves um, up tonight and um, made themselves a little bit vulnerable and um, brian and kaylee always thank you for the organization and immense amount of um, tech work that's um, going on in the background um and just a couple of things i was going to say we'll uh brian can confirm we're going to be putting this up uh, later on for access as a recording on youtube and um, we will be uh, editing this down and distributing it through the Road Journal channel as well as a as a uh, uh, as a uh, uh, 
possibly a, a transcript or, a, or a, a podcast. We're not sure yet. Um, but so there will be a couple different venues if, if you want to watch this again and relive the experience or watch it with your friends. Yeah, yeah the link will stay up for a while. We, we might or might not tweak the video just to clean it up uh, technically here and there. I put a link in the chat to the post hoc survey, but I think we all can see that this session was a miserable failure because as hard as we tried to drive a wedge between all these different topics, okay, and we wanted to uh, try, try to foment as much hostility among the panelists, it just didn't work. Uh, we seem to have converged on some really important themes, uh, which have a lot to do with putting the patient first getting our treatment to the patients and uh, being very thoughtful about how we do that in a larger sense. And so, no, I really appreciate everything that the panelists did and prepared for. And uh, it's a very exciting time ahead. I do think so. I do think that I do agree with that theme that was that was brought up. Uh, I do think we need to teach our, our enthusiastic, youthful, uh, up and coming trainees, many of whom are on uh, in the audience right now. And um, the field is exciting for a long time to come. And so uh, thanks again to everybody for joining in. Yeah, one of my one of my questions that I was I, I had hidden that that didn't get asked was, you know, how how can people get involved in some of this or how can they learn more about some of these areas? And um, I'll just offer up, you know, we have five really great panelists here today. I'm sure they would be uh, open to having you reach out if you're if you're interested. And um, we won't we don't need to go into all the specifics of it. But I, I do think there's a lot that can be done in radiation oncology. Um, even across multiple areas, if you're undecided. So um, thanks, everybody. And uh, Brian, uh, are you going to send the poll out? Yeah, I already put it out there. Uh, and like I say, a very, I think we had a very uh, great discussion, Convergent. Uh, I'll put it out through Twitter on the, the VPN uh, account and a few other places. So uh, we'll see if we get some thoughts, and uh, that'll be interesting. But next time, um, Conor McGregor, okay, he's going to be on, all right, he's going to fight somebody, I don't know who yet, because we, we, we need a little bit more, yeah, you know, yeah. conflict, I, I don't think we have enough conflict, but, you know, we did the best we could, so. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll feed him a bunch of protein or something. Yeah. Uh, thanks, everybody, so much. It was a wonderful discussion. And, thanks uh, you good, for, for emceeing. Yeah. Good night to everyone. Good night. Thank you so much. Bye,